sermon lesson this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll be finishing up the book of Timothy today. If you would please stand with me for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is real gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and into snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith, and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who is a testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the, at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithful servants, Paul and Timothy. We ask now that you would be at work in us through your Holy Spirit that your word might transform our lives, that we might be made different, that we might not leave this place the same, that we might be conformed more and more to the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Sarah and I recently uh, watched a, a TV series called The English Game. Uh, it's a late 1800s uh, period piece. It's a true story uh, about the origins of football. That is British football, soccer, not American football, uh, and the FA Cup, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's also about class struggle and uh, the fabric mills of northern England. It's kind of like take Downton Abbey and add soccer and, well, you get the idea. But football, as you might imagine, was developed uh, by uh, and defined by the rules of the Football Association, hence the FA Cup, which was established by the public schools of England. And of course, remember, public means private. It's the odd thing. Uh, in British English, and so we're talking about Eton and Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, these are the schools that are made up of wealthy landowners, nobility, upper class, and people with money, basically. But the cup itself uh, was open to all teams, regardless of where they might come from. 
And so the mill towns of northern England, of Lancashire in particular, like Blackburn and Darwin, uh, competed rather fiercely in these cups, even if they regularly lose. The big difference between the two, though, was that the teams that were made up of wealthy nobility, well, they had a lot of time to practice, right? Those guys have a lot of free time on their hands. And the mill teams, well, these are all hardworking men that barely have any time on the weekends uh, to get a little bit of practice in. This all began to change, however, when these mill owners in the north began to see the opportunity to make money selling tickets to their games. And on top of that, if they won the games, well, you know, you make more money, you sell more tickets. So the team in Darwin, the uh, owner of the mill there, hired a Scottish man by the name of Fergus Souter to become what essentially was the first professional football player in history. But there was a problem with that, and that is that the FA uh, that ruled uh, the cup and the division had a rule. No professional players. Now, Souter's hire was done on the down low so as not to get in trouble. However, Blackburn, neighboring town, hired Souter away from Darwin. And when that happened, it got rather obvious that professionalism was going on. The rumors became reality. So, of course, the other problem with Souter is since they were paying him, he was really, really good. In fact, the modern game in some ways was developed by him. And so it looked like Blackburn might now well beat the old Etonians and take the beloved FA Cup away from all the public schools. So the Football Association got together and banned Blackburn because of the professionalism of Souter and also because of a riot uh, that erupted after a match, or well, during a match, uh, between Darwin and Blackburn, of course, over the fact that Souter was a traitor and went to the other team. And their assertion was that professionalism was ruining the game. Now, the debate about professionalism in sports continues until this day. Uh, up until 1986, uh, you had to be an amateur to compete in the Olympics. And I'll, I'll use the term amateur, but uh, you couldn't be a professional athlete anyway, not in the formal sense. And this was meant to keep the sport pure. Of course, the problem was it meant that the very best athletes in the world were never competing in the Olympics. And, well, that was costing the Olympics money, and they decided to fix that. College sports was a strictly amateur affair, amateur affair, until just a few years ago when NIL, name, image, and likeness funding entered the scene. Now there is so much money in NIL licensing that some sports athletes can make more money in college than the pros. In fact, it's been widely reported that Caitlin Clark took a pay cut to play professional ball. Somehow I think she'll survive. Just recently, a huge federal case ruled that the universities will now have to share revenue with the athletes, so this professional nature of college sports, at least for football and basketball, the high money sports, is going to increase. Today, we are finishing up 1 Timothy with a passage that contains what is probably the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. You've heard the story, money is the root of all evil the saying, right? And although that's not exactly what Paul says, it does get at the debate around what money does when it's brought into any activity, namely that it ruins it. It's no longer a game that you play for joy, right? And that's what happens to sports. It gets taken over by the money, and then, of course, there's the gambling and on and on. And, of course, that's a lot easier to say, though, if you have money, right? That's kind of the tension that works out in the show. Professionalism is a lot better for the poor than it is for the rich. So what does Paul actually have to say about this problem of money? And how should we think about it as Christians? Right? How should we use money? What does it mean to us exactly? Well, let's dive in and see what we can learn. Now, the passage begins with a strong exhortation from Paul to Timothy to teach and urge 
uh, the basic principles of the faith, that is, the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul has laid out for him and has been preserved in the gospels, uh, and to do this in contrast with the false teachers that are present in the church in Ephesus where Timothy is ministering. Paul then goes on and he gives uh, basically his strongest both condemnation and description of these false teachers so far. Now, it was common uh, parlance back then not to name uh, whoever you're criticizing uh, in rhetoric, and so Paul doesn't name anyone specifically, but, but the way he sets this out, it's very clear that he has some very specific and very real and very present people in mind. This isn't just hypothetical. He describes them as this. He says, he is, this false teacher, puffed up with conceit, understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Tell us what you really think, Paul. In other words, these false teachers don't know what they're talking about, but they do know how to stir up controversy and dissension, and they do it well. But worse still, they apparently thrive on this chaos and the harm that they're causing in the church because they're making money off of it. He says they imagine godliness as a means of gain. And by gain, he means financial gain. And he doesn't mean actual godliness, but more like the promise of it or the illusion of it that is given in their teachings. And Paul contrasts this with genuine godliness, real godliness, which is content with having our basic needs met in this life, food, clothing, shelter, and so forth. And while he mentions only food and clothing, I think it's safe to understand this as a merism for all our basic necessities, much the way bread and water often refers to an entire meal. And his point is that amassing more stuff, right, the old he who dies with the most toys wins theory of life, is pointless. Because as he paraphrases Ecclesiastes, you come into this world naked and you leave it naked. You can't take this stuff with you. It's temporary at best. But for these false teachers, money has corrupted the gospel so completely that it's no longer the gospel that they teach at all. Remember I mentioned earlier a quote from one of my professors, if you make your living from the gospel, one of the two is likely to suffer and the idea behind that is sort of, right, the, the tension and problem of compromise. Well, in this case, the greed is, of these men has corrupted the gospel to such a point that it's no longer the gospel at all. There is, there's no compromise left. And then this prompts Paul to give his famous saying in verse 10. Listen carefully. It's not the same as the quote you often hear. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The problem here isn't the money itself, it's the love of money. And further, it's not the root of all evil. The love of money isn't the root of pride, for example, nor is it the root of sloth. The two might get conflated sometimes, but pride is not the same thing as avarice. And that's why we have seven deadly sins and not just one. That said, Money does kind of have a way of corrupting things and people and becoming the overriding force in everything that it touches. So if you take sex and you add money, you end up with prostitution and pornography and huge industries and businesses that swallow people whole. Of course, the same thing is true of illicit drugs. It's because of all the money involved that we have gangs and rival gangs and weapons and death and on and on. And that brings us right back to the argument about whether or not it corrupts and ruins sport. We could also talk about how it might corrupt politics, but again, let's not go down that rabbit hole. But the problem isn't so much wealth or money per se as it is the never-ending desire for more of it. Uncontrolled greed is avarice. According to a legend, someone once asked Nelson Rockefeller, the following question, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And mind you, we're talking about the wealthiest man in the world at the time. And his response was, just a little more. 
But perhaps more importantly, the love of money can just as quickly corrupt religion and even the gospel itself. And this is why Paul finishes with this line. He says, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, while Jesus himself is strongly critical of the love of money in the Gospels as well, I'm not sure there's actually a more devastating passage than this one to what, than what is known as the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel. Now, this is the teaching that's popular among televangelists that if you have true faith, proper faith, and you truly pray, you will be blessed with physical, material, and financial blessings in this life. And if you aren't, it's because something's wrong, right, with your faith. And one of the ways that it's demonstrated is by the wealth and success of the preacher himself, which, of course, he has gained off the backs of the people that he's fleecing, right? You could be rich like me if you just had faith like me. So prove that by sending me your prayer request and this donation, right? That's how the game works. This is what the love of money does to the gospel. Just after this, Paul gives instructions to Timothy as to what the gospel should look like in his life and in his ministry. But then he returns to the discussion of money with something of, it's almost like a a corrective, if you will, in verse 17. It's almost as if he remembers that there are wealthy people in the church at Ephesus that do have money, but have not necessarily succumbed to the love of money, at least not yet, such that it is a problem like it is with these false teachers. So what are we to do with money when we have it? And Paul's instruction for the wealthy, or really anyone with financial resources at all, is not to become proud in their wealth, or to place their hopes in their wealth, but rather to place their hope in God, who is the giver of all good things, indeed, including wealth and money. So yes, Christians do, in fact, receive wealth from God. All good things come from God. But it's not promised to us because of our faith, nor is wealth a sure sign and guarantee of our faith. God uses Christians in all states of life, both poverty and wealth and sickness and health as well. Further, the wealthy are not to use their, are, are now to use their money for good. They're to be generous, and they're to share their wealth with those that are in need. Note that Paul does not advocate the dissolution of all private property, or even that the wealthy should sell all they have and give to the poor. Jesus himself only uses that instruction to make the point with certain people like the rich young ruler who placed all of their trust in their wealth. Rather, he says, to use your money to help others, to advance the kingdom of God, to store up treasure in heaven rather than here on earth. And at this point, he actually sounds very much like Jesus in another passage in Matthew 6, where he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is the key distinctive of Christianity. Our ultimate goal is the next life, an eternal life. It's not in this one. We're not promised earthly blessings, but spiritual and eternal blessings. And that should shape and change everything that we do in this life as we anticipate the life that is to come. And that really brings us back to Paul's instructions to Timothy about how he is to live and minister the gospel in Ephesus, which began in verse 11. First, he says to flee the things of the false teachers, right? This is the strife, dissension, immorality, the love of money. And then positively, he tells him this. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. And he uses 
Christ's profession of faith before Pilate uh, is sort of like a, an underline, if you will, to emphasize to Timothy that the profession would ultimately lead to the crucifixion of Christ was the profession that he made. And I find it striking in this description of what it means for Timothy to fight for the faith in the midst and, well, against these false teachers, that Paul exhorts him to gentleness. I don't don't think it's surprising at all that he would tell him to pursue godliness and righteousness and faith and love, steadfastness. But gentleness stands out. It's a characteristic that would be in stark contrast to these false teachers themselves. Because they focused on contention and polarization. They capitalized and profited off the arguments that they caused. And they sowed division in the church. But Timothy, by contrast, even as he combats these teachers, is to be marked by gentleness. In our polarized world where everyone seems most interested in vilifying the other side and political arguments on social media, do you think that Christians are known by and recognized for our gentleness? Is gentleness how we respond to fear of losing control of our secular nation, as if we ever had it? Are we gentle to one another and to others? And I'm not saying that that means we should cave on our convictions, not at all, and certainly Paul wasn't saying that Timothy should give an inch when the gospel itself was at stake. And yet, our conduct towards one another and towards the outside world should be marked with gentleness. How is it possible for us to do that? Well, that brings us back to what we truly cling to and truly hope in, And quite frankly, it's not this country, it's not money, and it's not power either. It's about the world that is to come. Our hope is not in anything in this life. He tells Timothy, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second coming, that's the future that he's clinging to. And then he breaks into this glorious doxology that clearly describes our our world, our Lord in sort of otherworldly divine terms. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. And that language would have flown kind of directly in as an affront to Caesar, right? The true God, the true Lord, the true King is Jesus. But Caesar's the one who ruled the present world, but their hope wasn't in Caesar. Timothy's hope, the church in Ephesus' hope, our hope, none of it is in this present life. It's not in wealth, it's not in power, it's not in an election either. Our hope is in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave. And this is why the love of money and the prosperity gospel are so opposed to the gospel. Because they place our blessing, our faith, and our hope in this life and not in the next. Jesus didn't promise that. And it sells short the gospel. And worse still, when you don't get the blessings you pray for, you run the danger of losing your faith completely. Just ask anyone who's fully embraced the health and wealth gospel only to get cancer after praying to be delivered from it repeatedly. You can lose your faith that way. Now, we all need money. We all use money. We'd all probably be better off with a little more of it. Our world is obsessed with money. We're inundated with the proposition that our lives will only be better if we could get some more money and, well, buy some more things. Right? When better life through retail therapy is the cure of the day, how do we not succumb to the love of money? I mean, that's really the operative question. Well, we have to follow 
Paul's instructions. We have to use our money in this life for the kingdom of God. We have to be generous. We have to give to and care for people in need. We have to be looking for people in need. We should be giving to the church. We should be giving to those that cannot pay us back. That's how you store up treasures in heaven. Right? That's how we move our heart to a different place. Pray that God would give you a generous spirit. Focus your attention on the cross. Consider the sort of extraordinary generosity and blessing of God in sending his son to become one of us. Think about how much Christ gave up when he left the throne room of heaven to be born to Mary and Joseph in a stable. Contemplate that great love and generosity that God shows us in the great sacrifice for the life and death of his son. And then consider how you can use this life and the resources that you have for the next because Christ gave up his life to bring us to the next one. And friends, that's the hope of the gospel. It's powerful. It should transform how we live now for the sake of our future in heaven. And it is the only thing that can free us from the love of money as well. So friends, let us live for Christ and for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you that because of his great sacrifice that we are adopted into your family and that indeed we will inherit great wealth and blessings in him in the life that is to come. Help us to stay focused on that in this life and the hope that we have in the gospel. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand now and in response to the preaching of God's word, confess our faith with ancient words, with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty.